I'd like to introduce two very, very fine gentlemen who will introduce our first keynote speaker this evening. And they're on the stage opposite from me. Former Congressman George Nethercutt is a familiar face to, I'm sure, to many of you. And I can see you, you can see that he has a special guest with him tonight. Welcome, Slade. Thank you, John. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I want to welcome all of you here tonight and thank you for your support of the Washington Policy Center. It is my high honor to introduce the introducer tonight. <laughs> Slade Gordon has been a great fixture in our state. Uh, he has, uh, all of you know him, he has been uh, a very highly successful legislator. He was the Attorney General for the State of Washington, number 14 in our state, and he served with distinction in the U.S. Senate. So he's familiar to all of us, and he's, I've uh, admired him for a long, long time. He's a, a, a one in a million person to be the introducer of our guest speaker tonight, Joe Lieberman. Uh, they served in the Senate together. so. It is my high honor and privilege to introduce to you the Honorable Slade Gorton. Thank you, George. Senator Joseph Lieberman was the model of what a senator ought to be and how he should act. Persuasive of tongue, modest of ego, always willing to listen to others, but bright enough often to persuade those others to his point of view. He and I served together in the Senate for a decade. That Senate was a far more collegial place than it seems to be now. Senator Lieberman exemplified thoughtfulness and civility during his years in the United States Senate. He spends much of his time now attempting to restore civility to our national discourse. We didn't always agree. He's a Democrat. I'm a Republican. But Joe and I worked across party lines to get things done. And some, and he never, never engaged in personal abuse. He and I were each tasked by our respective leaders to come up with rules governing the Clinton impeachment trial. Our solution was not formally adopted by the Senate, but it was followed in practice from beginning to end of that process. Senator Lieberman was the Senate's leading voice in creating the Department of Homeland Security after the 9-11 attacks. He was also one of the country's leading voices for school choice calling for the expansion of charter schools, saying that more members of his own party ought to support school choice opportunities for all children. Good, that was a desired applause line. Uh, he's one of the very few Americans to speak at both the Democratic and Republican national conventions. And he was almost chosen by John McCain to be his running mate for vice president in 2008. Our national history might have been profoundly, and different, profoundly different and better had John not been talked out of that great bipartisan idea. <laughs> Since leaving the Senate, Joe Lieberman has been on a crusade to restore civility to our national discourse. I consider him to be a great man and a great friend. The Washington Policy Center, the nation's finest single state policy center, has made a wonderful choice in asking Joe Lieberman to Spokane. Joe.
Thank you. Well, Slade, that was worth the trip to Spokane. Uh, we, we, we developed a friendship uh, based on trust and liking each other. And um, we, we didn't always agree, but uh, it never affected our relationship. There's not enough of that going on anymore in Washington. And it's just a great tr thrill to see Slade Gorton again. George, great to see you, too. Nice to see you, too, Senator. And uh, I'll just say briefly, before you get to your questions, uh, how impressed I am by the Washington Policy Center. Uh, I don't think there's certainly nothing like this in Connecticut. And uh, <clears throat> as far as I can tell, nothing like it anywhere else. So thank you for what you do. And finally, uh, you've honored me by allowing me to be the warm-up act for Kim Strassel. <laughs> now, <laughs> If this were a musical event and not a public policy event, this would be like me being the warm-up act for Lady Gaga. <laughs> I know you agree. Okay, sorry, George. <laughs> no, thank you, Senator. Thank you. And uh, Senator Lieberman has to fly out tonight for Washington, D.C., so that's why we're, in lieu of a speech, we're doing a question and answer uh, session, and our hope is that we will be able to present lots of information to you all uh, that you're interested in. So uh, Senator Lieberman has also written a number of books and they are available outside the West Ballroom for purchase uh, from Barnes & Noble. Maybe you saw them already, but anyway, he's, he's a prolific author and he has some books out there for sale. And so I urge you, if Thank you're you. inclined to take a look and, and uh, buy them if you feel compelled to do that. Uh, I, I have a few uh, questions, uh, Senator, for you. Um, and the first is, you were you served in the U.S. Senate from 1989 to 2013. Right, 24 years. Yep. Right, and uh, what are you doing now? Tell the crowd, please, uh, what your plans are, what your, what your activities are. Okay, consistent entail. with being a warm-up act, I'll just tell you a quick story. Uh, uh, when I announced I was retiring <clears throat> from the Senate, I got a lot of advice and some uh, stories. And this one is my favorite sent to me by a college classmate about a man who worked for 40 years for a company, retired, didn't like it, and began to apply for another job at another company, interviewed by a young lady in the human resources department, and she asked him a classic question, sir, what would you say is your greatest weakness? And he said, my greatest weakness is that I'm too honest. And she said, well, forgive me, sir, but uh, honesty is not a weakness, I don't believe. And uh, he said, I don't give a damn what you believe. <laughs> <clears throat> so I followed that advice in my interviews. <laughs> I'm half time at a law firm uh, in uh, New York. I do some teaching at schools around, universities around New York. Uh, I'm on a couple of corporate boards and I'm, I'm on probably too many nonprofit boards, including a couple of think tanks. So it's. It's been, and more time with the family. Good for you, and, and maybe you can talk a little bit about think tanks, like the Washington Policy Center is a research, uh, probably the most prominent research uh, group in the country that deals with uh, think tank issues, right. and maybe you can tell us what, uh, talk a, a moment about think tanks and what your yeah, views when, of them are. When I was in Connecticut, as I, I said before, I guess, um, there was no think tank I could turn to, but when I got to Washington, I depended a lot on the think tanks, <clears throat> and incidentally, I went as often to Heritage and AEI as I went to Brookings uh, because I, I wanted to hear what they had to say. Uh, politics is still about ideas. Even in a, a partisan time such as we're in now, it's still about ideas. And the truth is that think tanks are a great source of fresh ideas, reasoned, uh, informed, and um, if they're really good ideas, they, they ought to be marketed to members of both political parties and maybe they can actually form a bridge uh, to bring the parties together. But um, I, 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 bottom line, here's something I learned way back when I was a state senator. You get elected to office, particularly as a legislator, you're expected to pass judgment on the broadest range of human experience 
And yet all you bring to the job, of course, is your own experience. So you better listen to people who are either living what you're about to make a law about or they're in a think tank and they can help you do some thinking to make sure you do the right thing. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. You serve on the board of the American Federation for Children, which helps promote school choice options just like Washington Policy Center advocates for. Um, we're talking charter schools and online learning, and uh, you've said that the school choice movement is like a civil rights movement. Uh, this is not a partisan issue, and you proved that last year when you introduced the education secretary designate Betsy DeVos at her confirmation hearing. Right. Talk to us, if you will, please, about school choice and the importance of it in our system. Thanks, George. I tell you, one of the reasons I was uh, really happy to be able to come out to speak to the WPC is the role that I think is really a critical role here in your state in the fight for school choice. Uh, I'll, I'll take a minute or two at this. I was the first in my family to go to college. Um, I wouldn't have been able to do so without the great teachers that I had in the public schools of Stanford, Connecticut. So flash forward, <clears throat> I get to be a state senator. My natural reflex is to fight for as much money as I can from the state government for the public schools of New Haven, which I represented. Um, but then I began to visit the public schools, particularly in low-income areas, and talk to the parents. And it was obvious that whatever worked for me wasn't working for them. If the parents, <clears throat> excuse me, who really cared about their children had the money, they would have done what any of us would have done, taken their kids out and sent them to a better private or faith-based school. <laughs> And I began to look at alternatives. I started to support charter schools. Republican senator from Minnesota, Dave Durenberger, who was Slade and I knew well, co-sponsored the first federal charter school uh, legislation in Washington that was enacted. <clears throat> um, when school choice proposals started to be introduced in Washington, uh, in the Senate, and I'd, I'd go and vote on the roll call, I looked around, and much to my surprise, I was either the only Democrat or one of two or three supporting school choice. And I, I, I said to my fellow Democrats, what's going on here? This is, um, this is about the education of poor, often minority children trapped in schools that are not educating them. W where are we? Why, why aren't you supporting it? Well, um, I'm not naive, and it was pretty clear that that um, they were responding more to the teachers' unions who were opposed to school choice than they were to the values that are supposed to animate uh, the political party. And, well, thank you. <clears throat> so when I say the school choice movement is like the civil rights movement today, it's because there are literally millions of low-income kids trapped in schools that are not educating them, and that means that they're not gonna be able to function successfully in our society. They won't be able to provide for their families the way they wanna provide for them, and they may well end up being uh, socially dysfunctional and totally dependent on government throughout their lives. Uh, this, the education system is not supposed to be about protecting the status quo or one way to educate our children is supposed to be about how we best educate our children. And thank you. <clears throat> so I, I am very proud to be a board member of the American Federation for Children working all across the country, not only as a think tank explaining why this works, and it does work, but uh, also uh, organizing politically to support people who will support school choice. And as a result, uh, in a lot of legislatures, state legislatures, hasn't happened in Washington yet, uh, when you look at those votes on school choice, more and more Democrats are supporting, supporting school choice because they know that's what their low-income minority constituents and their consciences tell them they should be doing. Yeah, thank you. Thank you.
You've been a big proponent of, of the D.C. school choice right. movement. Tell us a little bit more well, about Well, I mean, the D.C. Opportunity Scholarship Program is a school choice program funded by the federal government. We did something when we put it together to overcome the argument that we were taking money from the um, public schools. So we did it in three tranches. Equal amount of money, $20 million for the D.C. public schools, $20 million for D.C. charters, and $20 million for school choice. Uh, and yet it was a big battle. Again, I'm sorry to say during the Obama years when uh, the president and the Democratic majority tried to kill the program, but honestly, thanks to John Boehner and a few other of us who worked with him, uh, it survived. And here's the remarkable story. Um, these are kids that are chosen to go into this program because their parents want them to, but they are chosen totally by a lottery. This is not... Um, merit selection. These are just poor kids who want to, uh, whose parents really want them to do better. The, in a lot of big urban school systems in America, uh, less than 50% of the students graduate from high school. And it's close to that in D.C. Uh, in among D.C. Opportunity Scholarship Program participants, the graduation rate is close to 100%, and 93% of them, mostly low-income minority kids, go on to college. Now, that's worth support. You have spoken uh, previously about your, your own party, your Democratic Party colleagues, not supporting school choice. We face in our state the teachers' unions, which are are trouble for school choice. They seem to defeat it. Uh, how do we get more Democrats to support school choice programs, in your opinion? Well, confront them with the facts. Um, uh, get involved in their campaigns if they're willing to support school choice. Call on, we, we've got a, um, in the American Federation for Children, we've got a political action committee whose name I've forgotten. <laughs> Now, but we go into the state uh, legislative elections and support or oppose candidates based on um, where they are on school choice. And look, uh, a lot of them are, are going along with the teachers' unions because the teachers' unions have political clout, both uh, at, in organizing in elections, but also in uh, fundraising and contributions. And so we decided in the AFC that this is a problem that is not a problem of principle or morality, it's a problem of politics. And the way we're gonna beat it is with politics. And so um, bring out the ideas, make the case, let them see the facts. Urban Institute just had a great study showing the success of students in school choice programs across America. And then uh, work with the AFC, and I bet they put some money into this state to uh, support candidates who support school choice. That's great. Um, let's talk a little bit about international affairs and, and foreign relations now. Uh, you've been involved in uh, uh, supporting the uh, st strong national defense and engagement on the international stage. You favored pulling out of the Iran nuclear deal and, um, and are now part of a group called United Against Nuclear Iran. So where do we stand on Iran these days? Uh, well, we're, we're in a lot better position than we were a short while ago. And just as a show of bipartisanship, <laughs> that's because President Trump had the guts and I think the good sense to get us out of the Iran nuclear agreement. <laughs> uh, now, I'm not just saying that because I worked very hard against the agreement and I was a really disappointed when uh, Congress and the Senate particularly didn't step in to stop it. I, I, just to say, bottom line, it was a bad deal. I mean, we passed years and years of economic sanctions against Iran, and the whole purpose was to pressure them economically so they'd stop their nuclear program. Um, the previous administration gave it all away for nothing more than a pause, a foot on the nuclear break, if they're keeping their promise. And somewhere over $100 billion, which the Iranian regime has used 
to support uh, Hezbollah, Hamas, the Houthis in Yemen, the uh, militias in Iraq, and basically to stretch out their power, radical extremist Islamist power across the Middle East. So it took a lot of guts. It went against the grain internationally of what was thought to be the diplomatic thing to do, particularly in Europe, but uh, President Trump did it. And, uh, uh, and he's reimposed sanctions. So there's real economic pressure again on the government of Iran. The real, the currency is, is uh, uh, sliding in terms of its value. Um, more sanctions are gonna go on on November 5th. And uh, we're either going to be in, at a point where the Iranians are going to find their way back to the negotiating table and negotiate a, a really good uh, agreement and get rid of their nuclear weapons, or uh, the people of Iran are going to rise up and there's going to be a second Iranian revolution. And this one, in my opinion, will be democratic and not radical. We have um, only time for one more question, and I'll ask you quickly. Uh, for the young people in the audience, tell us about your views on public service. Is it still an important thing to pursue public service rights among young people and, and candidates? Yeah, I mean, look, uh, if you'd stop me when I came out of law school and said, Lieberman, what, what's your dream? What do you really want to do in life? Well, the truth is I wouldn't have answered you because it was too presumptuous. But, but what I dreamed of being was a U.S. Senator, and I was lucky enough uh, to live that dream. Running for Vice President went beyond that, and the possibility of running for Vice President on a different major American political party ticket, that was really beyond my dreams. But, uh, <clears throat> so I would say looking back, I was lucky, but uh, oh, you know, this goes back to the great story about Benjamin Franklin comes out of the Constitutional Convention in Philadelphia. There's a crowd outside, and a woman shouts to him, Mr. Franklin, uh, do we have a monarchy or a republic? And Franklin says, <clears throat> ma'am, we have a republic if we can keep it. And that's the challenge of every generation. There is tremendous satisfaction in public service. Uh, and I say to Young people, if you have the, any inclination for it, go for it. You don't have to run for office, but if you do, God bless you. You can support candidates, you can be involved in local politics on boards, but you will be having the special satisfaction that comes from serving a cause larger than yourself in the greatest country in the world. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Lieberman, and I, I know we're out of time, and uh, maybe we can all, uh, just as a, a final gesture, give Senator Lieberman a great hand, a great thank applause, you all. and God thank bless. you for being here. We'll come back. Thank you.